Chairman of the Condition of Masonry. We are the committee that reviews all of the reports from the District Deputy Grand Masters. I have about 25 uh, seasoned Masons who receive the reports, and they're in, in three parts right now, an L1 from the Lodge, an L2 from the District Secretary, and an L3 from the District Deputy Grand Master. They're due 14 days after the official visit uh, to the Committee on the Condition of Masonry. My team then goes through every one of those reports. So right now I think the number is 538 lodges times three reports, and then they repair, prepare a report for me on top of that. So they spend over an hour per lodge trying to get a flavor for what's happening in, that, in, in the lodge. And then our job, as mandated by the Book of Constitution, is to make recommendations therefrom for the benefit of the craft. Now that work's already done for this coming Grand Lodge. When you get your proceedings, your preliminary proceedings, you'll find five specific recommendations in there regarding uh, what we think will benefit the craft if we move forward in, in a general direction. We've also put together a three-year plan. Year one, which is this year, part of that first step of that plan was to change the technology. Yeah. I was a little worried about this, but it actually went very smoothly and I've gotten more compliments than not. This all used to be a, a PDF form, Excel thing that went on. It was very time consuming. My team will tell you that we've probably cut their, they, they are not taking any less time to do reviews. But what they're able to do with the reviews now, instead of secretarial work of transposing uh, data from a PDF into Excel, they're now able to spend their time reading and digesting and getting the flavor of the lodge. Uh, so we're not spending any less time, but we're better at what we're doing. We put together the submission of all the forms uh, on basically a survey tool. So you go in and you, you click the answers. There's text boxes for comments. Uh, once folks got onto it, it's pretty straightforward. The DDs right now, they're in 100%. Uh, we've only got four official visits to go now. Uh, the district secretaries are nipping right at their heels. There's probably only one or two to go. And there's about six lodges that are a little tardy, but I don't think any of them are represented in this room. So uh, we changed the technology, and I'm going to show you what the benefit is of changing the technology in terms of being able to instantly see the results of the questions. There's going to be a lot of graphs in this presentation, and it's simply the raw data presented to you. Here's the question, here's how it was answered. And now the next step is to figure out what those recommendations should be based on the data we're collecting. We're reviewing the form's content right now for next year. So although the technology won't change, those of you that are district deputies in the room, you can tell your successors, you're going to have to deal with the same type of technology, but we're going to refine and define and, and make questions. We're going we're to see what we can do to uh, rationalize a little bit, introduce some new questions, start probing in some different areas. Now, the first question that was asked of me as a new chairman, what do you do with all this information? And of course, being new, I had no idea. But what I found out was uh, we, didn't, we didn't re-disseminate the information back to the people that were giving it to us. So one of the things that we will be doing by Grand Lodge, so July 15th or so, there will be a comprehensive report of all of the questions, now the pertinent questions, and all of the answers in, in graph format. We will not be publishing any comments that we've received from anyone, but when you look at these graphs, we're going to publish the full set from the L1, the L2, and the L3. It will represent the entire jurisdiction's answers, and everyone will have an opportunity to see where they fit into those uh, various graphs. So what do we do with it? First, we're going to report back. Second, 
We have our analytics team that was started this year and we're still getting our, w the full wind in our sails. But we've started to look at things like what does it mean to be a cornerstone lodge? How do cornerstone lodges compare to those that haven't enrolled in the cornerstone program? How do they compare uh, uh, to, the, to the jurisdiction at large? Year two of our plan is this coming year, we're calling it 1516. Uh, we're going to be introducing an L4. Right now we request the financial statements of every lodge to be submitted. We have 538 lodges and 539 different formats for financial statements. Uh, we need to have some consistency there, that was recognized two years ago, and we'll be rolling out an L4. Everyone will answer the same questions so that we can get some consistency in analytics and data. That's, uh, that's the big thing. And then we want to refine our report back. We want to be able to, to not only use this information at the Grand Lodge level, but be able to make it meaningful to the lodges and the districts. So we'll be looking for some feedback. It's a, there'll be a little bit of trial and error. We haven't got it entirely figured out, to be honest with you. But we know we want to refine and improve our feedback to you in terms of this data. And in year three, we'd like to see if we can introduce a lodge-specific report back. Now I've called it kind of a health check, where each lodge, and it couldn't happen until June or July because we need all of the information in, but figure out how we can let the lodges know where they fall on the continuum in comparison to the jurisdiction and perhaps their district. So those are some of the goals that we have uh, moving forward. So what's important? What kind of questions should we be asking? What kind of things in masonry should we be evaluating? I think it's a, it's a pertinent question to ask ourselves. And just quickly, I know you can all read here, but membership, finances, ritual, uh, fellowship, Masonic education, officer progression, fa family activities, and community involvement. I'm going to pull up the results for these areas to give you a sense of uh, where we're at. I think everybody would agree finances are important, whether it's in our home, our business, our governments, we all, everybody wants to be financially sound. I think that's an important question to ask lodges, districts, and of course Grand Lodge. We all strive for that. Uh, membership. I think membership is a constant topic of conversation. I'm not suggesting I have some answers to that, but I might have some details in here that could help influence the conversation, could help inform decisions. And that's what I hope we're able to do with some of this. So here's an over, overview of our jurisdiction. We have 43 districts, 537 lodges. Now my team, when they review the forms and create a report for, for me and, and for me to report on, we have a really simple system. It's green, it's yellow, or it's red. And the good news here is that 62% of our lodges are green, almost two-thirds. Green reports I don't look at. I don't have time to look at them. Some seasoned uh, mason has reviewed them and has decided that in view of all of those things on the previous slide, this lodge has more good going for it than not. Yellow are those lodges that kind of fall in between. They're not in serious trouble yet. They have some obvious deficits in the opinion of the committee and some things that maybe they could work on. So they kind of get this yellow rating. That number at 32% or a third of our lodges, we need to look at that a little bit and see. And uh, the committee needs to refine some of its uh, classifications because this is very subjective right now. Uh, the reviewer has a big part to play on whether you're green, yellow, or red. Not, not, uh, not if you're really green or if you're really red, but when you're in the middle, it's, it's kind of subjective for them. The red lodges are 6% or 32 of our lodges are deemed to have some significant deficits. Um, and those are the ones that I believe we need to reach out to and find out where they're going and what they're doing and how they can help themselves and how we being Grand Lodge can help them help themselves. 
I don't think we should do the work for them, but I think we need to be a pillar of support, of guidance, of expertise, uh, bringing in the knowledge from around the district and the jurisdiction to help them solve problems. I suggest that probably they aren't experiencing problems that other lodges haven't already experienced and other lodges may have actually solved or resolved. So here are some of the results from our reports. This says membership, applications for initiation received. So here we go. I got some colors coming up there. Across the bottom, the green one is zero. The system kicks it out green. I don't blame me for making it green. 16.7% uh, of our lodges have received no applications for initiation. Little concerning. We've got the one or two at 39.5%. Uh, we, you know, that's, that's kind of that middle ground. You're getting some activity, but is it enough activity to keep the lodge at at least the same membership level when you consider demits and deaths and, and those kind of things, people moving away, etc.? One or two may or may not be enough to sustain you. We got three to five, 31.9%, almost a third of our lodges getting three to five applications for initiation. I think that's wonderful. Now we move down to the other end, six to 10 and 11 to 20. We've got some, lot now everybody might think, wow, that's wonderful. And it is, except you now have new, new issues and problems to think about. How do you keep that many members initiated in this past year, or applications, engaged and involved and interested in Freemasonry? How many chairs open up in your lodge annually? Certainly not 10 or 11, right? So how do you involve these new members? So that's why they kind of go yellow and red again, because although it's wonderful for a membership measurement, it, it creates um, an effort on the part of the lodge in terms of retention and engagement of those members, right? So I think it's really a thumbs up that 83.3% of our lodges are receiving applications. Okay? And if you're not in that group, you kind of have to ask why not? Okay? Because this is representative of the entire jurisdiction. And, we, and one of the things I want the analytics team to look at with this year's data is, okay, is there a trend on the 16%? Are they rural lodges? Are they lodges with less than 50 members? Are they, what, is there a trend to be found in there? My gut tells me no. That's just me though. Mind you, I've been spending a year looking at the numbers. But is there a trend? Is there something that we can target specifically on those kind of things? So I think that's good news. So membership, average attendance. We asked that question too. So I have some more graphics coming up here. This first one is 7 to 10, 6.7% of our lodges. We're kind of saying that's red. We suspect that those lodges sometimes don't have quorum. That, that's our guess there. You've got 11 to 15 and 16 to 20, making up uh, 56, almost 57 percent. Yeah, you know, 15 to 20 members showing up. That's not bad, not bad. We think you move into the green when you get up over 20 members consistently. What we haven't scored this against is the size of your lodge. This is all lodges, whether you have a membership of 35 or you have a membership of 135. But those of you who travel about the district, we know that average membership or attendance is actually in this 20 range, regardless of the size of the lodge. So what can we do to make our meetings more engaging, get more members out, uh, have more active participation in our meetings. But this is where we are today. Lodge dues. We ask what the dues are. The average resident dues is $131.39. Now everybody's doing the calculation. Am I above that or am I below that? Okay. Non-residence dues is $106.98. This is taking into account uh, entirely across the jurisdiction. I think when we look at average dues, we have to remember the expenses that have to come out of dues. $20 right now automatically goes to Grand Lodge. 
Okay, so that would take the, the money the lodge has left on resident dues down to an average of, of $111, $111 a member to operate on. You'll have a DDGM assessment usually. Bob, what's yours? $3.50. My district is $6. Uh, $6.50. Some are, ten, I've heard 10 or 15 in some districts. So take that off of what you have to pay. District assessment. Often lodges pay into some sort of district association. Two, three, five dollars a member usually. We're great at per capita assessments. And then your lodge housing costs. Um, in our area, it's getting to be about $100 per member per year to have access to a facility like this. Um, I th London is cheaper than that, I believe. Uh, but th these are the costs that the lodges have. So hopefully introducing the L4, we'll be able to get a better handle on some of these things and be able to provide even more information. But that's your average dues. Now, this is members 12 months in arrears. Here we go. Can you see that number? It says $409,110. 26.8% of our lodges report no one in 12 months in arrears situation. Awesome, I think that's wonderful. We've got a group in there of about uh, 41, 42 percent that have between one and five members. I think that's not too bad. But then we jump up to the six to 10, 10 to 20, and we have 3.8 percent of our lodges that have 20 or more members that they are reporting more than 12 months in arrears. Right now in this jurisdiction, as of uh, today or tomorrow, uh, $409,000 is, is owed to those lodges. Uh, that's an average, straight average of, of lodges that um, have dues owing of $1,062. And I think what lodges forget about is that, remember we talked about that per capita in the last slide and the money you need to collect to pay those kind of things on an annual basis? If you're more than 12 months in arrears, somebody else has to pick up your 20 bucks for Grand Lodge. Somebody else has to pick up your 350 for the district. Somebody else has to pick up your share. Um, this was identified, and this is an example of collaboration that is happening amongst the board right now. I passed some of this information on uh, early on um, uh, around Christmas to the Financial Advisory Committee, and if you took notice, their last financial advisory newsletter spoke directly to this issue. And this is part of the issue that comes out in, the, in my recommendations to Grand Lodge. I think this is a serious problem. I think this is a serious, more serious problem. In fact, I might call it a crisis. 8.9% of our lodges, when asked, are you financially sound, report no. Almost 9% of our lodges, folks. That's like 50 when we ask them. And, and we really don't put any context around them. We just ask them their opinion. In the opinion of the secretary and master, do you consider yourselves financially sound? One in 10 lodges, more or less, is saying no. No, we're not financially sound. Think of the trickle effect on our districts and think of the trickle effect on Grand Lodge. And what I want to explore uh, with this data is how many of those lodges are included in the lodges that were rated red? Because we have fewer rated red lodges than report they're not financially sound. I also think that this is the lodge putting their hand up and saying, I think maybe we need some assistance, some sort of guidance, something. And I think that Grand Lodge should be at least knocking on their door and saying, can we help? Not do, but help, guide. There are professionals working on the Financial Advisory Committee that, will, that are volunteering time that is worth hundreds of dollars an hour to give lodges some guidance, suggestions, and support. They can't do the job for them, but they can take their best practices from their industry and help you get better at doing what you're doing if you're in this situation. And I think this is a bit of a cry for help, and I also don't hesitate to call that a crisis. If that was 1 or 2%, and I called it a crisis, you could say I'm an alarmist. But this is almost 10. Early on, it was 
it's come down just slightly uh, as we've gotten more results in. So I think, it's, I think it's important that we get this feedback out there so people know where they're at. I think our lodges should be financially sound. Charlie. You're right. We haven't done any analysis and we're hoping that the L4 will help us, help them determine how financially sound they are. This is why I am concerned because this is simply the lodge looking at itself without uh, some sort of evaluation. So this number could be artificially low. I doubt it's high. I doubt it's high. So ritual. This is an interesting slide. I hope you can see it. Do I have to push the button again? There it is. Okay, we ask the same question to all three parties in terms of ritual. Are you above average? And we put some criteria around it. Are you below average? Or are you average in your ritual? I find this very interesting and somewhat counterproductive. In that, or counterintuitive. This is the lodge in blue. The lodges consistently consider themselves better at ritual than do the district secretaries and the district deputy grandmasters. I don't know. Um, usually when I evaluate myself, I'm tougher on myself than you are on me. That, that's usually the case. And you're definitely easier on me than my wife is. She's my harshest critic. But usually, but this trends the other way. This goes against what I would have thought would have come in where lodges were a little more critical of themselves, but lodges appear to be uh, a little easier on themselves. But as you can see, this is, overall this is still extremely positive. When we talk about ritual custodian, I think this is extremely positive numbers. We, we can agree that well over 250 of our lodges are exceeding the average. And we've got a good number of lodges around 200 that we would agree are in that average bucket. We've only got a handful of lodges over here that, that need to take a little more pride, perhaps, a little more time, a little more effort, a little more practice to get themselves out of that below average and, and bring up their ritual work. Ritual's important to us, or I think it should be. It's a cornerstone of our organization. It's part of an, our initiatory process. That's the first thing that really awes a man when he comes through the door, is people that get up and, and present the ritual as best they can, but often with precision and accuracy, and uh, impart the meaning of, of what Freemasonry is. So I found that one interesting. Officer progression. Another concern. We ask how many past masters are currently serving in, in what we call the, uh, our five line chairs, worshipful master, senior warden, junior warden, senior deacon, junior deacon. The green is yes, they are. So in this case, the red is no, they're not. Uh, you can see the trend line. The lower sort of down the, the progression from master, the fewer past masters that are serving. Um, we've got 43% worshipful masters sort of where it's a past master serving. Uh, it could be for the second year or two depending on how the lodge answered the question. Uh, what I think is really interesting is when we ask why they were still serving there, 49 percent answered they weren't ready. They weren't ready to advance. And I think that's an important question to probe on is what are we doing or not doing? What is it that's so ominous about the task? What is it that says we're not ready? That, that's, that's where I, you know, I think it's a question we need to answer. Visiting, fraternal visits made by your lodge. As you can see, 12.5% uh, have made no fraternal visits whatsoever. Um, uh, everybody else is making at least one. And we described a fraternal visit of five or more. Uh, members from your lodge and one of them being a senior officer, uh, worshipful master, senior warden, junior warden. If you're part of the Cornerstone program, you're going to be in, in uh, the group that has that. Visitors to your lodge. This I found interesting. Point two represents, I think, one lodge. They are reporting no visitors. That could be an anomaly. 
Uh, but you can see that over the course of the year, the high mark at 28% is 21 to 50, 25% for 51 to 75. If you think if you have 10 meetings, one's your installation, one's your official visit, and you're only getting 75 visitors, that's only 7.5 per meeting. Uh, I don't know about you, but official visits in our, our uh, district and the districts I've visited garner 25 to 30, maybe as many as 40 or 50, depending on the situation. Visitors out. Uh, installations are generally well visited. Um, seems like maybe we're not visiting as much as we could. Beyond the door of the lodge, community and family. Uh, socials, uh, family socials. How many activities did you have involving family, friends, and children? 22.2% report zero. Everybody else has had at least one or two. I'm concerned about zero. Uh, I think it's important that we involve our family and friends and, and do something at least once a year as a lodge. There's uh, ladies or widows, 39.2 are reporting zero. More than half the lodges are doing something with their ladies or widows. I think that's the positive note there. Uh, social, number of social activities, just social activities for the lodge. 22%, 22.7% say nothing. Yes, Masonic education and ritual are important, but I think the balance of that is the social, the friendship, the fellowship, the social intercourse that we as Masons share. We, when I run these stats, 30 lodges report zero on those past four questions. 30 lodges are going zero right up that, that whole thing. So where's the balance? We are social beings. One of the things that we, I find very uh, rewarding is being able to shake your hand, see your smile, have a conversation with you. Sit down afterwards and have a sandwich and uh, an adult beverage is my preference, but tea or coffee, whatever you have. Uh, I think it's an important part. Community involvement is equally as important. This is an alarming number as well. At 40.7% of our lodges aren't involved in the communities. 40, so if you've got a membership problem and you're not involved in your community, my 11-year-old daughter, soon to be 12, would go, duh. That's what she would say to me. Yeah, I know, I gotta work on the respect thing. But you know what I'm saying, if, that, if that's what's going on. So we asked the district deputies as well what their overall impression of the Lodge's community involvement is. And you can see the trend here. There's a couple that aren't acceptable. There's some that need me, needs improvement. But by far the majority, over 75% of our Lodges, have what the district deputies are feeling is satisfactory or above satisfactory community involvement. I'm hoping by sharing this data in this format, so you're going to see the question and you're going to see the graph in the report that we put out, that lodges and districts, district deputies and leaders and leaders-to-be will look at this information and start to put some plans together to change the trends. I'd love to stand here three or four years from now and say, this was 2014, but see what we've done with either the, uh, just a concerted effort by leaders in the field or by specific targeted Grand Lodge efforts, we have changed those numbers. We, have to, we now have nobody that needs improvement in community, uh, community involvement. Every single lodge or district, lodges in a district, have some presence in the community, whether it's through an open house or a fish fry or um, uh, uh, participating in a parade or having a booth at a community fair or running a Masana chip clinic. Something that takes this, this square and compass and puts it in front of the folks. One of the best uh, indications I had, we ran a uh, Masana chip clinic a number of years ago in conjunction with our local fire department as part of Fire Prevention Week. I had three people ask me, how do I become a Mason at that event? I didn't do anything. They just want to know how to become a Mason. Community, but that's an example, in my mind, of community involvement. So, 
my timer's going off and I've hit the conclusion slide and then I have some time for questions. We asked the district deputy grandmasters to give us their impression, overall impression of the health of the lodge and this is our trend. 43.5% are very good, 13.7% are excellent and we got 28% in satisfactory. I and my committee, this is the good news. That's part of that first thumbs up as far as I'm concerned. This to me is where some um, specific action and direction can be taken if lodges want it. So you'll, when you read my report in, in the proceedings, I think that we should be knocking on the door and presenting ourselves. But we, th there's nothing that allows us to come in and make unilateral changes. The lodges have to be willing to sit down, be willing to work with us. And again, I emphasize, we're not there to do the work for them, but we have access to resources. Part of the feedback I want to give to them and put in their hands is, this committee believes your lodge is right now struggling in these areas, okay? And this is, you know, how we can get you some help. This is where I, I want this committee's to go. I don't want us sitting on piles of information, uh, spreading it around just a select group of people. I want this to be public. I want this to be given back to the lodges. I want them to be aware, okay? And sometimes there's extenuating circumstances. Um, sometimes when we put a lodge up against sort of the, the normal, I'll call it the sort of normal standard, they're not quite there. But they're, they are a strong lodge. They are doing okay. But there are some factors that are critical. You have to be financially stable. You can't be spending more money than you're bringing in. In my opinion, your dues must cover your operating costs. Investment money should not go to operating costs. We, we have some basic things that we can help with. But they have to be willing. But I think we should go knocking. Read my report. I think we should go knocking. Final slide. Impression of long-term viability of this lodge. There you go. Again, by far, the bulk of the lodges have a good out, uh, future, good forward-looking, um, can, you know, are moving in a good grid. We've got some that need improvement. Those are those yellow lodges. And then we've got some that uh, the district deputies are also recognizing aren't acceptable. Um, you know, not to make predictions, but of those 30 red lodges, how many won't be here in the next 12, 24, and 36 months? If they don't do anything differently, I'm going to predict none. If they step back and start making some changes, I've seen it. People, uh, lodges and members of lodges have put a stake in the ground and said here and no further. They put together a plan and move forward, and I think Grand Lodge should be there to help them do that.